Um, it's already in 2019. We've seen some quite alarmist headlines in print and online media concerning Belarus in the international sphere. Um, to give a couple of examples, um, could Russia annex Belarus? Uh, claim, uh, asked Carnegie. Could Belarus's um, balancing act come crashing down? Uh, an article from Radio Free Europe. Um, and there are plenty more. Um, what all these headlines have picked up on is the idea from the Russian media that there's um, dissatisfaction in Moscow with Belarus's foreign policy. Um, and for those who've been watching recently, uh, perhaps the latest uh, instance of this has been the controversy surrounding some remarks from Russia's ambassador to Belarus, uh, Mikhail Babich, uh, who dared to criticise President Lukashenko, provoking some rather undiplomatic toing and froing uh, between Be Russian and Belarusian officials. So what's going on? Is Belarus's foreign policy changing, or is it merely a case of the world changing around it? In order to answer this, these questions, I want to draw on Robert Putnam's work on international negotiations, and specifically his approach to the international realm by looking at it uh, through what he calls a two-level game. Um, and my basic premise here is that foreign policy is, the interaction, is an interaction between domestic and international politics. Um, so for Putnam, negotiations between states involve two levels. At the domestic or the national level, uh, we have domestic interest group competition, and those in power are trying to shore up or maintain their position by building coalitions among these interest groups. And if the ruling elite cannot do this, then that imperils their position. Accordingly, in, the, in foreign policy actions, state representatives are both enabled and constrained by the domestic setting. At the international level, um, state representatives are seeking to maximise their ability to satisfy domestic interest groups, while at the same time minimising the negative effects of international developments. So similarly to the national level, one of the goals here is to try to shore up and maintain their position. So when it comes to international negotiations, uh, according to uh, Putnam, negotiating parties have win sets the range of possible outcomes that they could take back home and um, will meet sufficient approval with domestic constituents. Now, uh, in case anyone is familiar with Putnam's work, I should make two qualifications here. First, Putnam was looking at specifically at trade negotiations um, and I'm drawing on an article from 1988 when he was looking at um, G7 summit in Bonn. Um, but in effect, I'm suggesting that Belarus's, uh, Belarus's foreign policy can be looked upon as a system of negotiations with other actors um, at both the national and the international levels in order to obtain its perceived national interests. Um, I can see the objection that this is quite a narrow uh, definition of foreign policy, but I think it makes a lot of sense when we consider that we're looking at um, a state with relatively uh, little power especially if we're fairly relaxed about what we mean by negotiations, so that posturing and signalling, uh, rather than just mere talk, count as um, a, a, a part of an, uh, negotiating tactics. Secondly, uh, Putnam's argument and his analysis was based on liberal democracies. This is undoubtedly a significant difference. However, I would contend that it's not as consequential as we might think. Um, and we can discuss this more in Q&A if people so wish. Uh, but I would say that the basic mechanisms still um, apply. No leader can do what they want. Um, um, it just may be that the less democratic a state, the more informal practices um, and the less... Uh, the more informal the mechanisms and the less transparent the mechanisms... Um, but there are still various groups vying for the leadership's ear. So Lukashenko's position is secured by keeping these different groups happy, 
Um, and uh, I, you know, for those familiar with Margarita Balmacheda's book, then it's what she calls the nomenclatura players here. Um, so there are social and economic groups that need to be kept on side. Because the energy sector is so important to Belarus's um, economy, there are also many, rele- many of the relevant actors are in Russia, whether they be uh, Russian citizens or Belarusian descent, such for security services, military. Um, and we need to increasingly to recognise that society is playing a role in allowing the political system to continue to function. So with those two qualifications dealt with, if we look at the various goings-on in Belarus's foreign policy, then I think this two-level game approach gives us a certain amount of analytical leverage. And I'm going to touch on three areas. Uh, Trade and economics, uh, diplomacy and uh, prestige or image. Um, So before touching on those three, there are two questions to answer. One about the national level and one about the international level. So the first question is whether the competition between interest groups at the national level has changed significantly over the past few years. And I'm kind of picking up on that sort of from 2014 onwards here, really. Um, Well, based on looking at personnel appointments, cabinet reshuffles, economic trade patterns and such forth, my answer is, I think not. Um, The alternative would be to take some recent comments by Lukashenko um, during his big press conference where he was complaining about uh, the Kremlin uh, in Moscow's lobbying of certain groups. Um, But as I understand, he was talking about the Kremlin lobbying Russian domestic interests and these having uh, implications on Russia's policy towards Belarus. Um, Specifically, he was referring to agricultural um, groups and the dairy producers. Um, But I don't see anything new in this. Belarusian dairy producers have faced sustained bans from export to Russia since at least 2008. So the next question is whether or not the international level has changed significantly in the same period. Well, clearly relations between Russia and Western states have deteriorated. I don't think anyone needs any explication of that. Uh, My personal opinion, and it's very easy to find other opinions, um, but my personal opinion is that for Lukashenko, the basic perception of external threats to him politically has not changed and that alignment with Russia continues to be the best way to ensure his his own position in power. Um, But this is a judgment, and substantiating it is not that easy. On the other hand, economically, dependence on Russia has become more threatening for the sustainability of the Belarusian state. Um, I think we all know how sensitive and vulnerable Belarus's economy is to Russia's in this regard. So, in respect of trade and economics, I want to focus on Belarus's response to the so-called oil tax manoeuvre. Um, So this concerns uh, Russia's intended changes to the taxation regime so that extraction is taxed rather than uh, the imposition of duties on exports, which Belarus avoids thanks to being uh, inside the Eurasian Customs Union. Um, So Belarus has been complaining quite vociferously that Russia's domestic operators are being compensated uh, for uh, losses accruing due to the change, whereas Belarusian companies are not receiving any compensation, as things stand. At the national level, Lukashenko will lose his ability and his colleagues will lose their ability to pay off the relevant interest groups. I write payoff in a plain inverted commas. It's not it doesn't have to be taken entirely literally. Um, because of the importance of the energy rent to the Belarusian economy and by extension the leadership's job security um, the effects of this are considerable. Um, the cost has been estimated at about eleven billion in the period up to twenty twenty five. 
Um, and to put that into perspective, um, I, according to the IMF, nominal GDP in 2018 was 55 million US dollars. Um, thus Belarus, and we see then that how Belarus has been criticising not just Russia on this particular facet, but has actually been voicing criticisms of Russia's violations um, of customs unions terms more, more broadly. Accordingly, at the international level, Belarus has to try to maximise its ability to satisfy the same domestic interest groups, and in this regard, Belarus is bargaining with Russia to try to win these concessions. At the same time, we can see that the need to supplant the lost revenue is pressing and that there have been rather unsuccessful attempts to try to increase trade with several other partners, um, including diversifying trade with the EU. Um, and I think Belarusian officials are quite frustrated with the EU's inflexibility. Um, Lukashenko recently accused the EU um, of putting up an invisible wall of trade barriers. Next, how do uh, these straightened economic conditions reflect in Belarus's diplomatic relations? Um, well, I think the most significant recent development here has been the notion of normalisation of ties with the United States. Um, as many of you will know, the US hasn't had an uh, ambassador in uh, Minsk since 2008, I think. Um, and dip diplomatic representation has been fairly thin. While there's been talk of returning ambassadors in the past, which I've always been quite dismissive of, um, the current rhetoric is being promulgated at, quite, at the highest official levels and does seem to promise a lot more, um, even if it doesn't happen in the immediate term. The two-level game here helps us too. At the international level, it presents an opportunity, prospectively, to substitute for Russia's support. Once diplomatic relations are restored, the Belarusian side would presumably press harder for the lifting of US sanctions. At the national level, healthier relations between the ruling regime and the US prospectively helps to keep certain oppositional domestic groups weaker since the US would have to recalibrate its relations with various groupings inside Belarus. Thus, it would actually shore up Lukashenko's position. Um, and lastly, I want to think about the image of Belarus that's been cultivated through its foreign policy. And in this regard, I want to specifically mention um, the, the issue of self, uh, soft Belarusianization which we've heard about from um, Elena, um, and we're going to hear about from um, Anais Marin later on. Um, so I understand the idea here of as being Belarus strengthening its national identity through the promotion of national symbols, language, um, and history, and this, these being distinct from Russia. Uh, this was slightly different to Elena's uh, definition that we had on I mean, you were talking about soft Belarusization. I'm not sure if you, these if you, these are interchangeable in your mind, but we can. Um, um, so, over this, although this begins before 2014, I think there's been some renewed vigor in the past five years, um, and it's quite natural to view this as something originating from civil society rather than an aspect of foreign policy. Um, and I particularly be interested to hear. Um, and ISIS comments because I know in the recent Chatham House paper you spoke of this as being spontaneous and self-organising. Um, I'm inclined, however, to emphasise top-down aspects of this. And um, that's not to say that there aren't bottom-up aspects. Um, but I think there is a certain amount of evidence that this is happening from the top down. Um, there was a 2017 analysis from the uh, Warsaw-based centre from for it. Eastern Studies that I think Anna is representing um, and they're one of the first signals that they picked up that study picked up upon was the shift in narrative in the history textbooks um, then there's Lukashenko's ret rhetoric um, during his big press conference a few weeks back he said 
dla mnie belaruska mowa, mój rodny język. Uh, before adding uh, takoji kaki ruski. Yep. I'll just hold this. <laughs> um, and then he went on to say, if you're a nation, you need your own la language, your own language. Um, and as was mentioned uh, earlier, uh, I think Anna mentioned it, uh, he apparently spoke some words in Belarusian in public back in January. Uh, moreover, we should notice the presence of Elena Anisim, the uh, leader of the Belarusian Language Society in the Parliament since 2016. Um, again, something which I tend to look, down, look upon as a top-down decision, but we can dispute that if we want. Um, and at the same time, the limited extent of this is apparent from, if we look at last weekend's Freedom Day, Uh, activities. There's some opening up in allowing the celebrations in Rodna and Minsk, um, but at the same time these were kept away from the city centre. There were some arrests, um, and so I would echo what Yarik said um, in the Q&A in the previous session where there's, uh, there's an element of permitting certain things. Um, at the international level, Easing off the brakes allows Belarus to present itself to Western negotiating partners as gradually aligning to liberal democratic norms um, and therefore uh, increases its viability as a partner. At the national level, restricting the extent of Belarusianization is necessary so as not to empower oppositional groups and also so as not to upset uh, all of those pro-regime groups that are strongly Russophilic. Um, and this is a very tricky position for Lukashenko to hold while not imperiling his own position. Of us, I think um, that a lot of Belarus's foreign policy positioning, including in the three areas I've just discussed, is a context to the economic change, context changing, rather than being, uh, in the first instance, anything genuinely proactive. Um, and I do interpret this primarily as a response to economics rather than politics. Um, and the way that Belarus's foreign policy responds to these changes in its environment is filtered through domestic politics. This shows us the limits within, that policy, within which that policy can move. Um, Lukashenko needs to keep the relevant players rewarded and, therefore, and on side. Um, note that I am here giving some priority to the international In this way, and again this is somewhat different from Put Putnam, um, and for the benefit of those schooled in international relations theory, this isn't really a liberal analysis, this is a neoclassical realist one. Nonetheless, I don't think that we can explain these instances of Belarus's foreign policy without uh, positioning entirely without understanding domestic factors. Likewise, I don't think domestic factors alone would account for these foreign policy choices. If foreign policy was accountable entirely in terms of domestic forces, then it's hard to see where the interest in normalizing relations with the United States would come from, since trade and other ties are very limited. On the other hand, if domestic interest groups were unimportant, the leadership could simply divert resources from domestic groups to the center, rather than looking to change its posture in, international relation, in the international arena. Um, so as a concluding thought, Um, what are the implications of these small but appreciable change, changes in Belarus's foreign policy? Well, we need to recognise that Belarus's negotiating partners are engaged in their own two-level game, games. For Western states, this includes human rights groups and trade bodies, um, and these, kind, these groups enable and constrain their actions. So as much as Belarus's leadership is constrained in how much it can change, so too are Western states. Um, there is a limited overlap between the wind sets of Belarus and Western states, although I can see that one might argue that this overlap has grown in recent years. This suggests that the prospects for significant change in Belarus's international relations with the EU or the US are very limited. Yet given the dire need to adapt its positioning 
especially if Russia's economy remains squeezed. This would suggest that Belarus needs to look elsewhere. Um, accordingly, um, and here I will mention the Minsk Dialogue. <laughs> um, so the Minsk Dialogue produces um, a regular foreign policy report called the Minsk Barometer. And successive reports have shown a continuing and steady increase in ties with China, including increased uh, high-level cooperation. So this vector looks more helpful for Lukashenko if he's going to keep the two levels, the national and the international, in harmony. While personally I think this is a risky venture for Belarus, from the president's perspective and those around him, China could substitute for Russia's economic presidents and allow the leadership to keep the relevant domestic interest groups satisfied without the destabilising effects of the liberal reforms demanded by other negotiating partners. Thank you, Paul.